Hi, my name is Kim Ayres and I'm a portrait and narrative photographer based in Southwest Scotland. I'm Blake Miltier, curator of the McKinnon Collection, jointly owned by the National Galleries of Scotland and the National Library of Scotland. Can you give me a little bit of background about the collection, what it is, where it's come from, and what your job is with it? This collection of uh, un unparalleled collection of photographs was put together by Murray McKinnon, uh, who lived in Aberdeenshire. Uh, he spent about 40 years amassing this collection, and his interest was Scotland. Uh, and so the photographs in the collection are by and large uh, by Scottish photographers or uh, by photographers from elsewhere in the world of Scottish subjects uh, spanning the years uh, from the 1840s through to the 1950s. My role with the collection uh, is curator for a three-year project that launches the collection to the world, uh, obviously having been in private hands, uh, the collection wasn't experienced by many, uh, and now it can be uh, at both the National Galleries and the National Library. Uh, during this three years, we're cataloging the entire collection of 14 to 15,000 individual photographs. Uh, we had a launch exhibition here in Edinburgh, one at the, or part of it, at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, uh, the other part at the National Library, that was in 2019, early 2020. Uh, now the collection is uh, on tour. I started off in Banff and uh, currently it's in Kirkubri before it goes on to Stornoway. That by the end of the, uh, of the project or the result of this project, is that the entire collection will be published online on both the National Galleries and National Libraries website. So you'll be able to access each of the, of the individual photographs on the websites. Uh, you'll see the catalog record for it and very high resolution image, which you can zoom right into. And at that point, when it's all online, you'll also be able to, to book a reservation to visit either the Portrait Gallery or the National Library and see the photographs in person, uh, consult the photographs in at close range, be able to hold them, be able to experience it uh, in a way that is difficult uh, digitally and of course uh, is very different from experiencing it on the walls of the gallery. I mean, how much information um, are you also looking to gather about the photos? I mean, I know there's sort of some of them you've got rough dates or approximate dates, or there's others where you know who the photographer was or what the title of it was. Are you collecting or looking specifically for as much other information uh, around e any of the photos or all of the photos? Well, of course, we want the, the deepest, most comprehensive records possible. And within the collection, as we received it, there's great variety. Uh, some of the photographs, uh, we know exactly who did it. We know exactly when they did it. Uh, we know exactly where they did it. All the circumstances, circumstances that, uh, that led to the photograph as we experience it. Uh, and um, for others, there's almost nothing except for the image itself. Uh, so we are spending time uh, trying to identify some of the some of the unidentified subjects, some of the unidentified people. Um, we've engaged the public uh, on social media uh, in at a couple points during this project to uh, to help us identify places and people and uh, aspects of garment and, and various various uh, layers of the photographs. That will continue. Uh, I think it will continue forevermore. And once the collection is, is online, uh, and in fact, I should say that uh, about 1300 of the photographs are already online at, at the National Gallery's uh, website, uh, folks have already started feeding back to us uh, informa very valuable information uh, that sometimes confirms what we already have, sometimes adds new depth to what we have. I mean, I, say, I guess it could be sheep shearing anywhere, but uh, I, I love, if we could kind of, kind of zoom in here, when we look at this, the fact that everybody is sort of sitting there um, 
you know, obviously it's a smile for the camera to which some people are taking different ideas of what that means. <laughs> We've got smile for the camera here. I'm not smiling for anybody. I, this guy, I'm just going to carry on sheep shearing. I'm really not bothered about any of it. Well, okay, I'll stand here if you want me to. Um, you know, a kid looking like he's having a bit more fun. He can't be doing with any of it. You know, that there, there's that full kind of range that I think you get almost with any group that you attempt to photograph. Um, so it's obviously, it's partially posed, though, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's also part documentary. This presumably was going on as an event. They didn't specifically grab a bunch of sheep shearers in order to take this photo. Um, it would have already been an event, but they've all got to sort of stand and turn and look um, when they're told to, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I agree with you. Part of what, what's fascinating about this is, um, you know, clearly the, the presence of the photographer is part of the image. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, right, perhaps, perhaps a, a welcome one, perhaps not. Um, and, uh, you know, clearly these, these folks have stopped in the, in the middle of their, well, some of them have stopped in the middle of their work. Some have, have continued on. Uh, and, and one of the ways that you can tell that is that uh, this isn't a split second exposure. I don't think it's terribly long. It might might be a second or two. Um, but there are, are some of these figures in motion. Yeah. And you can see it from from the blur. Yes. Uh, the figure actually right in the middle of the photograph sitting behind the yeah, guy standing. Uh, he, he's clearly carried on uh, working there. <laughs> completely, uh, completely in spite of the photograph being made, uh, and is just a blur. And and what's interesting is, um, you're at this time, uh, and and if you if you zoom out again, there's another interesting aspect of it. Actually, right there is great. You can see that this was a glass plate negative by the cracks, the sort of V-shaped. Okay. Yep. I'm with you. There in the these center. Lines coming down. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it was printed despite the fact that the that the glass had been cracked at some point. Um, so somebody a felt it was a valuable enough image, uh, significant enough to, to go to the trouble to print, uh, and 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 b you have to realize that this glass plate negative was uh, you know, printed onto the light sensitive album and paper in sunlight. Um, so it's contact printed. That's why you get uh, get that sharp detail on, on the cracks themselves, right. but okay. also in, in the figures that um, that have taken the trouble to, to stand still, uh, to stop what they were doing and stand still for the photograph. Um, and one thing to keep in mind at this time is that uh, most professional photographers um, would have directed the scene so that every bit of it was as clear and sharp as possible. And because that was, that was the, the expected aesthetic of, of such a photograph because photographs could do that. Yes. One of the things photographs did best was to capture that exquisite uh, detail that our eyes see but that that's very very difficult to capture in a in a painting um and and by this point was was you know in the mid 19th century uh painting was becoming looser and looser uh, yeah. in the way that painters uh, or many painters uh, applied the applied the paint yeah. um, and we're leading up to the period of famously the the impressionists right yeah. um yeah photography offered up something quite different um photography offered up uh, essentially uh, you know the things that we continue to expect from photography that 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 clarity <clears throat> that um that veracity right that truthfulness uh, you know this is something that actually happened it's something yeah. that took place in the world there's a truthfulness uh, to it, uh, and, and unmanipulated truthfulness. Well, we all know that that, that <laughs> was 
necessarily <laughs> true all the way yeah. back to the beginning, but it, it was expected. And I think even to this day, we, we have, um, there's a certain part of us that, that uh, kind of expects that out of photography that, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it is distinguished in that way. It can capture something that actually did happen. Uh, even though we, we get photographs, very convincing photographs of things that never happen. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think there's um, that, there's that um, you know, the, 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 one of the phrases of photography we know more than any is the camera never lies. And yet I thought the camera never tells the truth. The camera is impossible of telling the truth. Uh, and yet we are caught up with this idea that we can't help but believe what we see. It just feels like we're seeing this with our own eyes. Um, and we have to make a next step to start thinking about the fact that it could be deception or illusion or carefully crafted to manipulate our response. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose something like this very kind of staged documentary in a way. It is that bit where, okay, stop what you're doing, look at the camera, smile, say hello, whatever, hold it for two seconds, right, thank you very much, we'll be on our way. This is by Charles Reed, uh, right. who was sort of famous at the time for his photographs of rural Scotland. And, and so not unlike the sheep shearers, which was a, a different photographer, um, you know, we're looking at an essential component of, of rural life in, in Scotland in the 19th century. It's got a very different kind of feel to it. This, this in a way, <clears throat> it's, I don't know whether it's as staged as the previous one, it doesn't look as staged as the previous one, because while we do have the woman here clearly looking at the camera, the person behind Lost in the Smoke is probably also looking at the camera. This guy here with the pipe is just busy carrying on with the horses. The lad over here with the axe is obviously looking in that direction. There is a feeling of this place has stopped and they're uh, they're either getting ready to go or they're, set, or they're settling down, getting ready. You know, we don't know yet whether he's harnessing up or unharnessing, I suppose. Um, maybe they're not leaving straight away because the kettle's on. <laughs> so maybe they've just sort of pulled up and they're getting ready to stop. Um, but there is a point where, but I mean, it's beautifully composed this with, you know, the way the lines, you know, the diagonals draw you in and the whole shape of the photo. Uh, so they know they're being photographed and presumably they, the, the photographer will have had to have had a little bit of permission. Uh, you're not going to just sort of turn up, stand this in front of um, some, you know, gypsy carts or whatever and not expect for somebody to come up and go, oi, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but at the same time, it does have a slightly more naturalistic look than the previous one. Um, what I also actually just a little, kind of slight little uh, tangent here, all the baskets and chairs and everything, I assume that they're, they're going from town to town selling these things, maybe making and selling these things rather than that just being their own furniture, which they're carrying with them. Um, well, they, they were. And, and this was one of the main ways that uh, rural communities bought such items, uh, you know, prior to the, to the, uh, onslaught in the 20th century of shops like <laughs> before <Walmart>. Amazon <laughs> yeah well and, and yeah speaking of, of onslaught in the, in the you know, current day Amazon um but yes and and so so travelers such as the ones we see here would would go from community to community uh selling things like the, these uh baskets and chairs yeah I was I was struck I looking at this earlier I I suddenly this little spark of a memory somewhere from childhood i'm fairly certain i have an ancestor there was talk of some great great grandfather or uncle off on some direction who was a journeyman basket weaver and presumably then this is pretty much you know it went going from town to town making baskets selling baskets repairing baskets um so probably unlikely to be my relative but i guess this is probably that's maybe like a bit of an insight into what he would have been and how he would have lived as yep. well. 
you, you get all these lovely old postcards of old towns, you know, you see this kind of stuff an awful lot. And what is fascinatingly wonderful about this is I know Dumfries, I know Dumfries, anybody who knows Dumfries knows this place completely. And there's so much which is still there, even to the interesting point whereby, you know, in the, if, you look, if you look at a Dumfries town centre photo from, say, the 1950s, what you see are the cars and the buses that are all, but it's been pedestrianised in the last 20 years. So actually you don't have the cars and the buses on it now. It actually looks more like this <laughs> in some ways. Some of the buildings are a bit different, but, um, and noticeably, I suppose we've got the, the horse carriages here um, rather than, you know, cars and so fantastic set of top hats <laughs> here as well. Uh, the, mid, the mid steeple tower, absolutely. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the mid steeple tower here, absolutely, you know, is still there. and. Again, this is a very well thought through composition. So we have the Dumfries Fountain, which is there. And, and of course, you can see um, Greyfriars Church in the background there. You know, if the, the photographer was a foot to the left or two foot to the right, it wouldn't sit beautifully in that little bit of space. Uh, so, you know, and, and your eye is drawn straight. You know, the, the composition, all the compositional techniques, you say like a painting and what have you, have been taken and put into this to create this, this photo that allows you to fall into it. Um, only now, 120, 30, 40 years later or whatever, we can go, oh, well, where it says Coffee House Hotel, that's where Top Shop and Burton's or Boots or Dorothy Perkins or, you know, whatever shop happens to be there, although it may well have closed down during the COVID time. <laughs> um, but you can look around and think about where the different shops are, but in a lot of ways, it doesn't look hugely different. Well, when George Washington Wilson made this photograph and, and uh, he made photographs of high streets all over Scotland, <clears throat> the idea would have been, uh, this was of course the center of the communities. This was the intersection of, of commerce and culture uh, one of the places that would have distinguished this particular community from all others. Uh, the fountain, of course, uh, in this image would have been you know, one of the, the main components of that. Um, and uh, it, it is interesting to, to look at these things uh, now in, in contradistinction to, to the way they appeared and often functioned then. This one I love. I, I, I can feel the photographer wanting to create something that is like a painting, like a, probably like a painting they've already seen in a gallery somewhere of, um, you know, and you've got the innocence of the child in a beautiful draped cloth with the lamb, everything. And it's like, OK, we've got her, we've got the lamb. Look, have you got a blanket? You know, Elsie, you got a blanket. You get me, <laughs> get me a blanket. Okay, throw the blanket over her head. And it's one of those things where I can feel what they're trying to do and feeling like, and they just sort of don't quite get it. We, we look at it now and part of the love of it is because it's an old scene, it's an old photograph. We look at it and it's hundred plus years ago. But actually, if you were trying to set that up, if you look at this photo as a, imagine you were there trying to create this photo and I think you look at this photo in a very different way. You start thinking, well, you know, okay, is that sheep trying to run off again? Or, you know, we've got, don't get that sheep because that's the one that's really boisterous. This one's the karma sheep. Let's get them over there. Um, and yes, that blanket, that, that, that sort of tweed blanket, which just sort of sits there, just, when would anybody ever wear a blanket in that way? You just wouldn't. Um, <laughs> my wife noticed that the, the material here in the blanket is also looking like the same as the underdress of the, the girl there as well and of course a great set of muddy boots <laughs> underneath that is um but you know that that sense of i'm going to create a a, a narrative photo you know a photo like a painting with sort of probably religious overtones and and references and, and what have Absolutely. you I, don't you think that um he would have been drawing upon his audience's um recognition of perhaps traditional madonna and child images as well as mm -hmm. uh, popular nursery rhymes yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that we all might still be familiar with. Um, I mean, and, and it's, this is, is most certainly a, a representation of a rural ideal 
uh, that that I would suggest perhaps wouldn't be reflected in in everyday life. Um, and and in that sense, um, there's perhaps some undercurrent as well uh, that his audience may have also recognized that there there, there is a a degree of innocence and 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 loss of innocence mm -hmm. uh, implied in this in this image, uh, because that that uh, that lamb will have a a fate that um, you know the the young girl may not be terribly uh, aware of quite yet. Mm -hmm. I is. also it, it's got quite she's quite tight lipped here. There's a kind of pressure on those lips. It's like. Mm. How, long, how much longer do you want me to sit here for? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing this because I've been told to, or maybe I'm being bribed to or blackmailed to or whatever, but, um, you know, I'm not going to be 100% happy about it. <laughs> and it's interesting where, where Reed has her situated, you know, sort of in this gap in the wall. So there, there are uh, sort of, counterpoint V shapes here that seem quite deliberate, you know, even where her, her arm is sort of wrapped around the, the sheep a bit. Um, and so it's, it's quite yes, compositionally, but... Um, yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, you could, you know, the way, the way this, the wall in the background comes down, it's sort of a kind of leading line towards her head, the use of triangle you know, with the with the, the shape of the blanket, you know, you, you are creating all these little kind of diagonals and leading lines drawing the eye where you want it. Um, so yeah, there's there's clearly a lot of thought gone into the creation of this. It's just that I can't look at this without thinking what it would be like if I was trying to get my daughter to sit and pose like this, because I had this idea which I thought was brilliant and nobody else did. <laughs> Well, you you definitely get the sense that here by the by the eighteen nineties, uh, when this likely would have been made, that uh, we've definitely got uh, shorter exposure times. Yes, uh, available to us than than the earlier sheep shearing image. Yes, and I think that's that's one of those things about the development of photography. You know, it, I, you know I remember hearing long before I took up photography. One of the reasons why so many of these Victorian poses everybody looks so stern is because you had to have something like a four second or even an eight second exposure and you can't hold a smile for that long without your face starting to droop and then going out of focus so everybody's got to stay absolutely still for several seconds which is extraordinarily difficult to do if you've ever tried you know doing a four second exposure of yourself and trying to stay rock solidly still it's nigh on impossible um, but yes as time goes on so you can get faster shutter speeds and faster exposures. Uh, and it, you know, we've got some beautiful ones later on of sports people at, at play, um, which can only happen with much, much faster shutter speeds. But at this point, everybody's got to be stock still with it. So yes, we've got this one on Loch Troll, and it is looking like it's supposed to just be casually capturing, you know, the, the oarsman is there, oars in hand, except for the fact the guy with the bottle of champagne is sitting on it. So, <laughs> so obviously he hasn't just rowed into place, otherwise, unless he managed to row at exactly the point the person was sitting down. He's sitting there with his bottle of champagne. She's got a gun in her hand. I mean, that's how, Galloway. how yeah. Wild West is that, you know? <laughs> um, True. And how long has he been drinking from that bottle? Yes. <laughs> so he's busy holding that. Um, he's staring into the camera. These two, I mean, they're just giving the photographer the look of death. I mean, you just, uh, it's, it's quite I, I can imagine this sort of sense that, you know, you've got this, I suppose, upper class party going on who consider photography to be something for commoners and beneath them, or certainly feel that the photographer himself is just a tradesman. And so don't, wouldn't have any respect for him whatsoever, but they've been told that they need to have this photo because it's going to look great and it's going to capture the moment. And so I, I find again, it's this, it's this thought, I mean, again, being a photographer when you're interacting with people, 
you know, some people are absolutely into having their photo taken and it's all great fun and they get into role play and acting with it. And it's huge. amount. Some people just don't want to be there and they're only there because somebody else in the group has forced them to be there. And they are going to make sure that that displeasure is utterly known by staring down and glaring at the photographer in a way. Um, I've been on the end of that occasionally. It's not comfortable. Uh, <laughs> But it is such a it's such a strange one of right. We're going to create this, and but it is so posed while trying to make pretense at the idea of naturalistic. I think. Yes. Yes. But again, the slightly long again that slightly longer exposure given away by the fact that the water, the ripples in the water, are all fairly smooth. So possibly at least one second, possibly up to two second exposure. I would, I would be my guess on something like that, even though it's a, a bright, bright, sunny day. Um, well, and as, as you pointed out, you know, this is all quite deliberately staged and, and aligned with that would be the fact that to, to get that, to get everything as sharp as it is, and you have but to look at the, at the boat, uh, even the oar there, um, <clears throat> but with the, with the blurred water suggesting that, you know, it is, a, a longer exposure. Uh, you have to imagine that the camera is on a tripod, um, so the photographer is is standing there, probably probably waiting to some degree, directing uh, the activity, possibly getting some direction from <laughs> from the <laughs> Countess of Galloway. There, uh, she 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 gets her pose with the with the pistol exactly right. Um, <laughs> yes, it's all the, the stories that we can that we can read uh, in these images are, are quite fascinating often. And <clears throat> this uh, is a page from an album, wow. a, a photographic album. Uh, there's a similar photograph on the on the other side of the page um, in which you know, individuals, as you, as you see here, are identified in the in the inscriptions below, uh, but one wonders, you know, what happened to the rest of the album? Clearly it was split up mm. over time. Uh, pages removed, uh, sent in different directions. And, uh, you know, what, what, what's the remainder of the content in this album? What's noticeable about when we look at some of these photos is that uh, is the development process or the or the printing process rather. I noticed that up until sort of the end of the eighteen hundreds, uh, most of them tend to say they're albumen prints. Uh, Prints, whereas once you sort of get into the twentieth century, we're then into the silver gelatin. Uh, but there's sort of been, a, a, but there are a couple of other kinds of printing processes. What I mean, how did they kind of become more popular? There was a goal from the outset to, I think, create a, a more usable medium uh, in as many different formats as possible. I think all along with a thread of intent in being able to publish photographic images more efficiently. Um, that was, of course, one of the major restrictions with daguerreotypes, uh, with calotypes, with ma many of the early processes is that they were not, either they were not easily reproducible or not re reproducible at all. Um, you know, daguerreotypes are, are one-offs. Those are unique objects, very individual objects. Um, with Talbot's calotype process, you did create a negative that could then be uh, reprinted as a positive any number of times. Uh, but that still didn't help us too terribly uh, much in terms of publishing. Right. How, how then did you get that image in a book? Um, <clears throat> printmaking at that point, uh, you know, engraving primarily was still the, the, the primary means by which you, you reproduced an image in, in publication at that time <clears throat> and, and up until uh, 
Later in the 19th century, if you wanted a photograph in a book, it had to be the actual hand printed photograph essentially adhered onto the page of the book. Mm. Um, and uh, I mean, not, not tremendously, unlike the way you would create a photo album. Uh, but even in a, in a printed in a printed book, if you wanted a photographic image, it had to be an actual photograph. So I go into an antique shop. Sometimes you you'll still find a, a 19th century book that you pick up, and maybe the frontispiece is an actual <clears throat> photograph mm -hmm. uh, rather than a, than a printed image. Uh, but then, as the 19th century went on, uh, we did invent mechanical means by which to reproduce a photograph. Uh, you know, first it, it was sort of a, a transitional, transitional uh, means uh, in which to, to do that, uh, but um, you know, sort of, sort of hybrid uh, photographic and printmaking processes. Uh, <clears throat> but then, by the late nineteenth century, we had half tone printing and, and could reproduce uh, as many different, uh, as many uh, images in a book as. as as we needed. Um, so you went from some of these books being you know, fairly unique uh, objects or, or certainly limited uh, in their production uh, to being able to print thousands and tens of thousands of, of books with photographic images in them. So I, at about that time, we, our relationship with photography was changing as well. Right, um, you know, many of the photographs that we've looked at so far would would have been uh, would have been uh, not necessarily unique objects, but there wouldn't have been very many uh, mm -hmm. released out into the world. And photography was still very much in the hands of. of professionals. Yeah. Uh, but by the, the late 1880s, um, everyone started to be able to, to carry a camera around um, <clears throat> and, and make their, their own photographs. Yeah, yeah there's the kind of um, this democratization of, of photography. And of course, the I mean, interestingly, you know, the, um, the development of, you know, the fact that everybody's got a a camera on their phone now i i've had interesting conversations with, with people you know professional photographers in the last sort of 10 years who bemoan the fact that well now everybody thinks they're a photographer because they can just you know they can whip out their phone you know what does that do for us my thought with that is i can imagine the same kind of problem being when so what the kind of conversation scribes were having when reading and writing became more mass and more popular oh great so now everybody can read and write that's us out of a job then this isn't right it should be left in the hands of the specialists you know and yet for all the fact that everybody can now you know write a christmas card or text their girlfriend or whatever doesn't necessarily mean everybody knows how to write a best-selling novel or even good sales copy uh you know that you still go to a specialist to get the right kind of writing and I think similarly, I, I love phones. I love the fact that everybody's out there because I think it, it sort of lifts people's knowledge of photography. It, it makes it so much more. And yeah, it's fine. There's lots of people thinking, hey, I could do this for myself. Obviously, as soon as you try and make a profession out of something, you realize there's a whole load more stuff that you would never take into consideration. But I think it's OK. I love the fact that people are more knowledgeable about visual aesthetics as such they've got a sense of well that's working that's not um and you no longer necessarily have the technology getting in the way of i mean it's like i remember back when i started you know when you look analog photography you take the photo you don't know for two weeks whether you'd even taken the lens cap off you know until you get the pictures back from 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 the chemist or the pharmacy or whatever just you know you don't know what was in focus these things i lined it up i go click Oh, looks like you've got a plant growing out your head. Hang on, let me move around here. Click. Oh, it's focused on the wall rather than on you. Click. Oh, that looks good. Three pictures and I've already bypassed five years worth of photo photography training on how to use the equipment. <laughs> and you um, don't have to worry about the airlines losing 50 rolls of film. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's not costing. Yeah, so it's not costing you a fortune. Um, 
And I think that's brilliant. I think that, uh, that, that uh, so that people can get into being creative straight away and learn the visual language as well, which I think in turn makes it quite possibly really interesting for something like this collection. Because you can look at the photos beyond just, oh, um, is that my grandmother? Is that of my grandmother's generation? Am I really interested in, in it? To, well, what if I was doing my own version of this now? Oh, well, actually, th those, that bunch of people in the boat, if that, they, imagine those were my mates and we were deciding to recreate a photo like that. Now you can imagine exactly what it would be like. Um, and that, that photo, which might have just been a static black and white image from some bit in history, sort of almost dismissive, suddenly gets full of life as you realize it's real people with different attitudes and interactions and power relationships and that relationship, of course, with the photographer as well. So, yeah, I, I think as the technology changes, um, our relationship with the camera changes and as, and as more people get it, each generation that had to learn the hard way bemoans the fact that the next generation seemed to have it easier. <laughs> Um, but then I'm sure, you know, I'm sure it would have been a case of what do you mean you've created a bow and arrow? A spear was good enough for me, was good enough for my father and my father's father before him. You kids have no idea how lucky you've got, <laughs> how good you've got it these days. Well, we did have this phenomenon in the late 19th century, even with photography being such a young medium at that point, you know, keeping in mind that photography was only introduced to the world in 1839. Yeah. So even today, I think we can consider it, you know, compared with painting and, mm -hmm. and forms of sculpture and you know, drawing uh, a very young visual medium and uh, perhaps one that we're still, you know, sorting out in a way in terms of our relationship with it. Um, and in the late 19th century, at that point in which, you know, you, you could you could go to the chemist and buy a camera that was already loaded up with, with film and, you know, uh, make the photographs with that, send it off and get the, the photographs and a new roll of film loaded up in your camera back. You had professional photographers saying, whoa, wait a minute, hang on. Uh, yes, everybody can do this, but not everybody can do this, if, yes. you, know, if you know what I'm saying. And, and um, you know, so, and that was one of the, the ideas um, uh, among, photographers who considered themselves artists was to say that this is not a 100% mechanical medium. Um, <clears throat> you know, yes, push the button and, and we do the rest. That's, that's, that's one way of making an image. But <clears throat> we aim to show that photography can also be uh, manipulated, um, arguably, to not dissimilar degrees as as a, as a painting or or a sculpture, uh, in not just in the dark room, but from as photographers later in the twentieth century would say, all the way from the the sort of pre visualization uh, and intent behind an image, all the way to how that photograph is presented, every step uh, along the way. Yeah. And so I wonder, based upon something that you said a moment ago, uh, as far as where we are right now, um, how do you think we'll look back from, from future decades and, and say, oh, well, we hadn't quite sorted that one out yet, um, but, but here we are. Uh, are there any aspects of photography that you think we'll... Uh, that we're living with right now that in, in future decades we'll look back and think hmm, wow um, we had some work to do there well i think it's it's strange i mean there i do kind of feel there's a sort of transition period with the growth of the mobile phone photography um and of course the mobile phones are becoming incredibly sophisticated now I, any you know if your phone's four years old it may as well be of the time of the dinosaurs. You know, the cameras just aren't, whereas modern cameras now have so, it's not just a case of it will take the photo. It has all sorts of computers and algorithm programs going into um, 
bring the uh, bring down the highlights to boost up the shadows so you can get in detail in awkward lighting conditions and it will do it all for you it will just has face recognition uh, image stabilization uh, you've only got to pretty much wave it roughly in the right direction and you'll get an okay photo. And for most people, okay is good enough. But I think the, the, the thing about photography is, and the value of photography and the value of photos is that they grow almost exponentially over time. If I take a photograph of you today, how much is this photo worth? Really virtually nothing. I could take, I could take 10 of them and none of them stands out necessarily. Tomorrow, you're going to look pretty much the same. In five years time, that photo we now look at and we go, oh, look how when I had more hair and I was lighter and I, it was, wasn't as gray or whatever. And in 10 years time, even more so. And in 20 years time, are you still around? Are your children, your grandchildren now looking back going, oh, do you remember when? Um, I've had these conversations with wedding photographers where, who are always frustrated at people who have, they'll spend tens of thousands of pounds on their wedding. And then as an afterthought, oh, we better get a wedding photographer. And they will just sort of look around for the cheapest wedding photographer they can find. And yet, 20 years down the line, the wedding photos are probably the most important part of that wedding, more important than any other bit of it, because it's now the gateway to the memories. You will never have the chance to have all those people in that place at the same time again. You won't be that young again. You won't have that part of the life. And so if you got in the person who didn't really know what they were doing, it becomes really noticeable. So I've always said, get the best wedding photography you can. Whatever else you're doing, either budget, budget for the wedding photographer first and then work everything else. And I say this, I don't do wedding photography. I, um, but I always said, and, but that notion then that photos become more important through time. I think, you know, because of the way we see that, we see the photos of our parents when they were young or our grandparents or our great grandparents. I've got a photo of my great grandfather um, in regalia uh, he was an officer in in the during the boer war for the argyle and sutherland highlanders um and that's the only photo i have of him. i've got no idea what what he was like as a person but that is the single entry point to my great grandfather so the photos we have now are disposable we upload them to the internet we look at them on facebook we click like on instagram and then it's gone what starts to become interesting is now I notice Facebook is now every day pushes Facebook memories. And if you've been on Facebook for 10 years, suddenly periodically these little images come up that you put up 10 years ago. And now you start to get that effect again, even though they were digital, even though they were taken with your phone, even though they were just casual throwaway images of your lunch in that particular cafe. Suddenly there's, there's a connection with them. There's something that's interesting about them. And I think the bigger the distance in time, the more powerful, the more valuable those photos become. So it becomes really difficult to judge at the moment which photos are valuable, because in five years, 10 years, 20 years, that's when it's going to become really noticeable which photos were the most valuable. Fourth rail bridge under construction. Oh, it's an amazing photo, just you, and I, I think, and actually, I, I will compare just next to this because there's another lovely photo which I like, which has the same kind of impact on it, which is this one um, of the ship. And with both of them, what you've got is these huge, gigantic structures. So it becomes really important to have the person in the foreground to relate to them. I mean, if I, I'll just very quickly open this with Photoshop. And if I do something like, um, where's the spot healing tool? Sorry, zoom in a little bit here. And I would just remove this person, just very kind of briefly, something like that. So the person is gone. It's still an interesting photo, but actually it doesn't have the same impact. I think having the person in there makes the difference. Um, what's also interesting about both uh, sorry, close that one. Both this photo and this one, I think, is again in the printing process where the foreground is much darker and the background gets much lighter. 
as well. So with this, your eye, or even though this is a huge structure, your eye is drawn to the person in the foreground first, and it's also drawn over to um, the crane here, and it sort of creates a slightly different context. And similarly with this one, we've got um, our eye is drawn up here where it is darkest, where there's a place of most contrast, and it fades out as it gets to the background. And yet in reality, although that sort of, you would expect that if it was a misty day, if we look at the shadows on the wall here, this is a bright sunny day. This is bright sunshine. This is this is not um, a misty day, but the the print so the the printing process has been very carefully done to highlight and burn in more detail. So your your eye gets drawn to one part, and then it fades out so that the other part becomes supporting. You only notice it afterwards rather than the uh, the front part. Well, you you identified something fairly elemental here, I think, and that's the way that light has been employed in these images. Obviously, it's it's natural light in both these instances. It's it's uh, existing light that's uh, contributing to the to the atmospheric perspective uh, that you also pointed out. Uh, very bright sunlight in both cases. Very directional in both cases, uh, and I think very deliberately employed here by the photographers, <clears throat> almost as if um, almost as if they, they've perhaps not waited for terribly long for the right light, but you get the sense that both were familiar enough with the scene, uh, had planned sufficiently that they knew as best they could what they were going to get out of a particular uh, environment for their photograph. And that's where I think in this particular image where the placement of the figure comes in, uh, because you know, one of the things that's really outstanding, no pun intended, uh, with the figure here is the shadow. Mm. Because I, in, in spending time with this image, I really wasn't aware of the light uh, at the forefront, as being at the forefront of this image until that moment I noticed his shadow. Mm. And then it all came together. Yeah. How, how uh, specifically constructed uh, this image is. And so, you know, in, in earlier photographs, and this would be from the 1930s, but in earlier 19th century photographs, you often had a figure in it for scale. Yes. Right. Because in, in many instances, if the photographer was going out into to a, a landscape, they were first and foremost, probably photographing something extraordinary. Um, you know, that many weren't photographing a bog. They would be photographing extraordinary rock formations, extraordinary coastlines, uh, extraordinary uh, mountain profiles, that sort of thing. Um, they would put a figure in for scale because at that time, knowing that many of the people viewing the photograph would possibly never visit those places, they had no context uh, about the scale of it. So you, you would see a figure placed in them. Um, and this figure is there, I think, for that purpose, but not exclusively. Mm -hmm. He's there, he's, there, he's there for us, really, uh, in, in a sense, to, to place us uh, in that image and, and sort of feel the, uh, not just the physicality of it, not just the, phys the physicality of the uh, engineered objects in the photograph, but, but feel the, the presence of, of the light as well. With also, I think the other thing with both of these is you get such a sense of futurism um it's retro sci-fi almost you know you it's it from the past as they are you know, i mean we look at that for the you know the fourth rail bridge now is is old it's centuries old it's you know, it's a victorian type or whatever it's it, we think of it as an old thing and likewise um this huge ship you know is, is built at a time and yet that i mean it could almost be a spaceship you know in, in that kind of 1920s 1930s um, Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon style of futurism, which now looks so horribly dated, but at the time you just sort of looked to the future. And, it, and it's really strange thinking the what, how different these photos would have looked to the people at the time. 
to how we look at them now as well, I think. You know, the, the idea behind each of these images were, as you described it, these, these were extraordinary accomplishments, right? That, that in, in fact, beacon Scotland's uh, engineering uh, ingenuity to the world, right? In, in both instances, as regards transport, you know, transatlantic liner uh, or the engineering marvel that was the fourth bridge. And what I like to think when I see this image, uh, and there are many images of the, the fourth bridge and its construction in the McKinnon collection, but to me, this is one of the most extraordinary because you really get a sense of the scale here. Now, to keep in mind, this was <clears throat> this was 100 years before there was another bridge. Yeah. Um, there was nothing else like it, not just, not just across the, the Firth Forth, not just in, in Scotland or the UK, but in the world, there was nothing like this. And what it must have been like to stand there on the end of the pier and see this thing unfolding as it was constructed, and then to see those first trains go across. Um, I mean, in Scotland in particular, after the Tay Bridge, disaster mm. not so long before um, so what a marvel it must have been and, and today what what's our experience well uh, we I mean we can we can experience it from from the same perspective of course uh, but the way most of us see it is in our peripheral vision going across one of the other two bridges yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> um, so and, it, and so it, it's um it's a completely different experience now than, than what these, the, the, the folks standing in the picture uh, would have experienced in the, in the late 1880s. You mentioned the, the Tay Bridge disaster. I was also really struck by this photo here, which um, it says these, these tickets are, were collected at St. Fort Station on the 28th of December, 1879 by uh, Robert Morris agent, um, William Friend ticket collector and Alex uh, Inglis Porter from the passengers who lost their lives in the fall of the Tay Bridge. Now, of course, this is referring to when the storms took out the Tay Rail Bridge um, with the loss of all these lives and the tickets have been collected. We can see where people got on at, um, where, where they were going from Abernethy to Dundee or Lucas to Dundee, um, Edinburgh to Dundee. So they kind of got on at different places, sort of heading across. Um, you can, so we can see where they've all been clipped as well before going on. And then we have uh, the driver photo of the, the train driver. So there's photos being put on it with the tickets. And then the whole thing has been sort of photographed as one in itself. This, this collage, this... Um, I think the idea of taking photos of photos as well, you know, to sort of make a, a, a bigger story out of it is, is really, really quite fascinating. I mean, very poignant too, um, to take those clipped tickets and say, you know, each of these represents one of the passengers who didn't survive the, uh, that, that terrible day. Yeah, and I think the other three, and what these, these photographs in the corners are, these are little carte de visite, photographs, um, you know, little visiting card size right. photographs yes. that, that mm -hmm. uh, were introduced in 1854 to, to the world. And this was one of the first sort of affordable photographic formats for folks. And so this is when you started to get uh, more and more photographs made of, of uh, you know, the middle classes, especially. And so in the so yes, yeah, she has the driver up here in the right. I think it's a line, a lineman, uh, yeah. two guards at the bottom. So uh, you know clearly That's folks sorry. Employed, employed by the railway, but everybody else represented by those tickets were presumably passengers yeah. on on the train, uh, and as suggested by the text at the bottom. And so uh, yes, it, and it's a, a very interesting uh, and and. Um, unparalleled object, even in the McKinnon collection, uh, in that, yes, as you noted, we've essentially got a, a photograph of photographs, uh, but more than that, uh, th this 
sort of diamond shaped uh, design with the with the ticket stubs uh, sort of laid out in clearly an aesthetically uh, astute manner there to create a, uh, an interesting composition. Uh, it serves as a memento mori in mm. a way and, and something unique to photography. I mean, you, it's perhaps not unlike the, uh, the last two images we looked at, um, the, the Queen, uh, Queen Mary and, and the fourth bridge. It's difficult to imagine those images or, or this image being as effective in any other visual medium but photography. Mm. I think the previous two, because of the, the engineered structure uh, and, and especially in the bridge, that, um, that detail uh, and, and the fact that, um, you know, we're, we're looking at something that was uh, essentially uh, created hand in hand with, with the industrial revolution, right? Um, and, and then with the construction that you see in, in that uh, photograph of the uh, memorializing the, the folks who perished in the Tay Bridge disaster, um, in a way, it's simultaneously a document uh, and a memento mori, which, which slips into something a bit more transitory, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and something that goes far beyond, I think, what we might call a, a descriptive, yeah. right? That we might describe, as we were talking about earlier, uh, as, as, um, as fact, as truth. It, it has a different function than that, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's meant to, to engage us on an emotional level, yeah? yeah absolutely. Uh, and yet, and yet, this image would not work nearly as well in any other visual medium than, than a photograph. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting intersection uh, of, of intentions here, and I think quite an effective one. It's an interesting idea of essentially what photography is in terms of, is it, a, is it a tool for documenting or is it a tool for art? And how much or, you know, and how much does that blur? I and mean, I think very often you get people with quite kind of extreme views on that. You know, there are some people who think that all the camera is, is, is a tool for documentation. Um, and then there are others for whom, no, photography is art. I, I mean, and then that, that varies from country to country as well. I think, for example, I think in America, there's much more of a history of a sense of photography as an art form than there is in the UK. There are still pockets in the UK where it's very difficult to get photos recognized as an art form. Um, it's seen much more as, you know, a technical exercise rather than necessarily an aesthetic one. And any aesthetics that come into it are almost accidental and not really part of what photography is. And I think interestingly, when we look at some of the, you know, some of these photos are definitely documentary that what, what interests us in them is the documentary. You know, so when we see an old photo of Dumfries and we go, oh, I recognize that bit. I'm overlaying my own understanding of this and seeing how that's changed. So the documentation of that is, is really interesting. And yet at the same time, there is a strong aesthetic side gone into it. As we said about that idea, if somebody moved left or, or to the right a couple of feet, that photo maybe wouldn't look quite as good. Um, so there's the use of aesthetics to, to, to create a narrative for us. So we're not just seeing things as they are, we're seeing things as we're led to see them, um, which, is a, which is a different thing. Uh, but also then there is that notion of the art side of it, like the, the young girl with the lamb, where it is directly trying to imitate art, to imitate maybe specific art. Um, I've done various photos before now where I've done them in the style of 
a 17th century Dutch master painting, for example, you know, where if you take the same tropes, you use that style of lighting and you use that kind of material and you have somebody in a specific kind of pose, that photo can look very painterly. Um, and it's not about documentary as such, it's about creating something which looks slightly more artistic, or you have a group of people gathered around a table. Whenever I have a group of people around a table, everybody goes, oh, Last Supper. <laughs> Doesn't matter if the photo looks nothing like the Last Supper whatsoever. It's just, it's the idea, there's a group of people around a table. It's the bit everybody latches onto. Um, but yeah, a lot of the photography I do is constructed narrative, where I am emulating ideas from the art world. And I'm creating things which look theatrical or cinematic, even where you are trying to create a story within what you see. So that there's always this sense of when you're looking at it, there's something bigger than what you're actually seeing. You get the, I always the difference between a snapshot and a really interesting narrative photo is the snapshot tells you everything you need to know within the photo, usually within half a second. Here's my lunch. Here's me and the wife in Marbella. You know, <laughs> there's not really a lot else to say. The interesting narrative photo, you're going, oh, I wonder what happened just before that photo was taken or what happened just after or what's happening out with the boundaries just, you know, or behind the photographer's shoulder or just out of sight behind over there. And I think the moment you start asking questions, this moment the viewer starts asking questions, that's when you're into narrative. That's when you're into storytelling. That's when, when the viewer is bringing part of themselves into the questioning process. The picture just suddenly expands and becomes so much bigger. But I think you see that phenomenon all the way back to in Scotland here, Hill and Adamson, uh, working in the 1840s, the early 1840s. Um, you know, we're, we're through their primary subject, uh, photographs of people, you, you, you get those, all of those sensibilities you just, you just mentioned uh, through their subjects. And they're as suggestive in many cases as they are uh, depictive uh, of, of you know, the physicality of it. And um, of course, this was something that as you, as you move into the 20th century, uh, photographers picked up on again. And even again, sticking, stick, sticking here in Scotland and, and of course with the McKinnon collection, um, you had photographers you know, like, like James Craig Annan, uh, who you know, in service of uh, you know, sort of pictorialist ideals at the turn of the century, were looking back decades before to Helen Adamson uh, and saying, look, this is what photography can do uh, photography does have the capacity uh, to address us uh, on more emotive levels um, and um, more intellectual levels, in fact, uh, and, of, and of course is something that we, we can manipulate to, to serve us in those ways. So, yeah, one of the next ones I want to talk about was this one, uh, which I absolutely adore, the, the woman golfer. And it's such a, this is your, I suppose, this is you know, not just the birth, but the, the real, where it's getting going with the high street photographer, where anybody can now go and for their number of pennies or dollars or whatever can get the, their photo taken. And you've got this wonderful painted backdrop sitting behind. Um, now, I'm aware as we're talking, we've got real backdrops behind, but you become very aware these days of Zoom calls, how people quite often have false backgrounds. You can even choose whether you want to look like you're in an office or you're out in the countryside, or you can stick your own photo in to have as a background. Um, and in a way, this is the kind of the early version of that. They, the two, you know, most photography studios, maybe they had one or maybe they had two or three particular painted backdrops. Um, and, no, the, the ultimate in the posed photo, I've got my golf set, I'm going to stand here, I'm going to take on the golf pose, and we all know it's a posed photo, but, you know, that little smile on her face, we're all in on it at the same time, and so we're happy to kind of accept the conceit as such. You know, often, and I, I've seen this lately in, in the photo albums I'm cataloging now, um, you'll start to be able to identify a studio by the backdrop. Yeah. <laughs> 
you'll see the same backdrop uh, used over and over and over and over again uh, with different subjects in not dissimilar poses. Um, yeah, I, th I think this one is somewhat extraordinary in terms of being a, a Scottish subject. And of course, with Scotland's historic relationship to golf. Um, and, you know, the Victorian era, you know, saw a dramatic increase in the popularity of golf. Uh, and this, of course, was, was prompted by the uh, explosion of, of rail travel and, and um, you know, mechanized manufacturing uh, and affordability of, of equipment. Um, so again, hand in hand with, with the Industrial Revolution, uh, all of that. And by the time this photograph was made uh, around the turn of the century, um, women's golfing had grown grown for, for several decades. And you know, the first women's golf club had been formed in St. Andrews in the 1860s, I believe. Uh, so this is, um, I think this is a very uh, significant image in terms of those bits uh, of history. I think also what I get a feeling with this is in a way, it's the sort of it's the selfie of the of the time. Although she's not done it herself, it's tapping into that same kind of idea of, you know, we take now we do it with the phone, take photos of ourselves, and you know, in particular places or with a group of friends or whatever, in a kind of a brief statement of how we wish to portray ourselves to the world. This is who I am, or this is the best version of me, or even this is a fantasy version of me that I wish I want other people to think that I'm like. Um, and in this case, they're commissioning somebody else to take that photo of them. Uh, what this person is like in any other aspect of their life, we have absolutely no idea. But how she wishes to be portrayed is as this golfer. Um. <laughs> well, I, it, what's, that is interesting, I, I think. Um, you know, somebody, I was talking with somebody just a, a few weeks ago. Um, and they were, they were sort of pondering, you know, what it would look like if you were able to know how many images of yourself are out in the world, especially online. And what this person was, was thinking about specifically was, was surveillance. Um, you know, all of the cameras, uh, that, that you, you, you walk under on the streets uh, and in shops and, and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, presumably a lot of this is, is on the internet somewhere. And you combine that with all the, the pictures that you know are on there. You know, when somebody goes to a wedding and then dumps mm -hmm. uh, 367 images <laughs> on, onto their Facebook page all at once yeah. um, and, and you're in, uh, you know, 43% of them, <laughs> um, you know, if you, if you could sort of spontaneously know of all of these images of yourself that are online, how many would there be? What would that look like? Um, and with this image, you're still at the turn of the century living at a time where, of course, cameras and photography were familiar to people by this point. Um, you know, there was a point earlier in the 19th century in which it wouldn't have been, it would have been odd to see someone with a camera out on the street. But by this point, it was, it was fairly, fairly uh, common. And yet, people probably still had a very countable number of photographs of themselves made in their lifetimes. Um, you know, with few exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it was special. As, as you suggest, to, to have a photograph made. And, and uh, you know, the way, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, you used to dress up to go on an airplane. <laughs> but, but who does that anymore? <laughs> Maybe it was just my family that did that, I don't know. Uh, but, um, you know, the, these kinds of things, you, you, the way you presented yourself was important. Uh, and, and certainly in a, in a visual format that was enduring 
like a photograph. Mm -hmm. So this is this is one of the standouts from the from the McKinnon collection um, in many many ways, uh, not least of which, as you've observed, uh, it is there is some color to look at here, whereas most of the work in the McKinnon collection, uh, and and surely most of the work uh, photographically created between the eighteen uh, forties and the and the you know, mid twentieth century is monochromatic. Uh, so. One of the ways to, to get color into a photograph in 1908, one of the very limited number of ways to get color into a photograph in 1908, when this was made by John D. Stephen of Aberdeen, was to hand color it. Uh, and that's exactly what we're seeing here is a hand colored gelatin silver print uh, photograph. So hand colored black and white photograph. Um, and uh, it is called the dawn of, of light and liberty. And so when you think about it, uh, everything in this photograph stacks up to that title. Uh, so what are we seeing? We're, we're seeing uh, the center of Aberdeen here. And as, as you've noted, the, the statue of William Wallace uh, as a representation of, of liberty and, and, uh, uh, and, and freedom and these milk boys out on their morning deliveries. And so we know it's morning, right? Because the title suggests it, dawn. Uh, the colors suggest the dawn or reiterate the, the dawn. Um, you know, we know that's the time when, when milk boys are out doing their, their morning deliveries or were out doing the morning deliveries. Um, and so it, it it's all there. And as it happens, uh, this was one of Murray McKinnon's favorite photographs in the collection, uh, as he articulated to me uh, the first time I visited him, uh, visited him, in fact, in Balmedy, which is just north of Aberdeen. So we talked a while about this, this photograph, and he was very sort of matter of fact about it, just sort of describing uh, what it depicted and you know, what he enjoyed about it. And so I asked him if he, if he knew where it was, because I wasn't terribly familiar with Aberdeen at that point. So uh, he gave me an indication where it was, and so I made a point of stopping through Aberdeen on my way home found the location, of course, the statue is, is still there. Um, much of the, the, the civic profile you see uh, on the horizon is still uh, there, still recognizable. Um, it's a bit busier uh, now than, than, than it appears to be in this photograph. But uh, what's interesting is, from the photographer's perspective, you are actually facing east. Mm. You're, you are, in fact, facing the sunrise. So there, there is a sort of factual aspect to this photograph. Otherwise, I, I, I get the sense that it's, it's very staged, this mm. image, right. uh, perhaps sort of stacking up to what the photographer intended, uh, you know, with, with that title, especially. So what's the suggestion here? Well, we've talked about what the statue represents, and William Wallace representing Liberty. Uh, he's standing there, not so much in the in the posture of a of a, of a warrior or a soldier, but an orator. Yes, mm. sort of the Roman orator addressing addressing the people, as it were. Uh, well, who is he addressing in this photograph? Well, the only people present are these are these milk boys. So so he seems to be, in a sense, addressing them. And although we're, we're in this silhouette, we're actually looking at the back of the statue, we're looking at William Wallace from behind, that's, that's not terribly important. He could be facing, facing us for all we know. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's addressing these, these, these boys walking off into the dawn of a new day, uh, this is sort of, sort of the, an early point in their lives, you know, their young lives. And as they go off into the day, off into their lives, it's almost as if he's, he's uh, bestowing this sense of, of responsibility that comes along with liberty uh, on them. So there's, there's, there's very much a, a message here and, and very much uh, a sense of, of tapping uh, uh, an emotive uh, 
perhaps a little bit nostalgic, perhaps a little bit uh, patriotic place in the viewers. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, what's also interesting, I, you know, you say so there's multiple, all these multiple layers you can you can read the story into it. You get a good title, and it just sort of echoes on multiple levels. I what I find interesting with a lot of these, I'll just open this with Photoshop a moment, is um, because of course we're now looking at this. This is a faded photo from a hundred years ago. And I sometimes wonder about the notion, I mean, you, you've done high resolution scans of these, but if I do something like, it, if I just take a levels here, and if I bring that up a bit and bring that down a little bit, suddenly we have a sense of more detail, sort of that the colors become very slightly richer and the, you know, there's maybe a little bit more detail out of this. And if, if I uh, select all copy, Paste right, so I've got this now. I put this onto um, into raw filter. I can then take this a, a step further. I can up the exposure of it, maybe bring in a little bit more texture or clarity or something like that. Um, and although, unfortunately, at this point, what happens is it means that all the the noise and the and the little flecks and the bits that are peeled off also become more heightened and exaggerated. Um, parts of the railing sort of start to come out a bit more. There's a little bit, we can we're making out a bit more in detail of some of the buildings in the background. Um, so it's kind of, it's interesting. We look at these old photos and we sort of see them. It's almost like that's the way they always were. And yet originally they might not have been as faded and soft. It could have been quite a bit richer and deeper in the way that they were done. That's true. Uh, in this instance, I think it's probably primarily the color that has changed. I mean, mm -hmm. it's essentially uh, you know, subject to the same kinds of um, environmental issues and sometimes uh, inherent vice that uh, you know the color in a painting or a colored pencil drawing would be subject to. Um, but what's interesting is uh, for comparison. In the McKinnon collection, we also have a version of this photograph that's not hand-colored. Oh, right. It's just the, the, the black and white uh, gelatin silver print. Uh, and and it looked like great. That. Right, yeah, if we so, remove the color like that, I suppose, or even, you know, with a... Um, yeah, so it's not dissimilar from that. Mm. Uh, I think perhaps with a bit more clarity to it, yeah. even. Um, a bit warmer in tone, as I as I recall. Yeah. Um, but it's an interesting comparison, mm -hmm. and so it, it's very clear that uh, for John D. Stephen, uh, he felt that uh, some color added to the narrative. Yes. As you were talking about earlier, in terms of you know creating a narrative with with the photographs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's fun. I think what's also interesting with it, with this photo as well, and you, you can do it with some, when you've got a very specific place, as you say, you, what you did, you, you actually went there and took a look in person. And even if you can't go there in person, these days you have things like um, Google Maps. And let me just pull up this a moment and uh, go to Maps. And if we type in... Uh, Wallace statue Aberdeen. There we go. This will show us exactly where it is. And of course, if we want, we can do the street, you know, we'll take a look from, from above and we can see that here, here, it, here it is. So what we can also do is that we can grab street view. We can grab our little man. And if this, as you say, they were facing east, if we plonk him about there somewhere, Oops, hold on, turn it around. There we go. There we have our William Wallace. Um, let's move forward one, maybe. Yeah, we've got our William Wallace. Now that church, steeple, is now tucked in behind all these buildings over here. The, the, the dome, which we had there, is now lost behind these buildings over here. We've got this bit of dome, which I presume, oh, sorry, wrong, wrong one there, there we go, is this curved building here, I'm guessing, it's probably this one here. 
So you've got some of these buildings are still there, but a lot of them have been built up around. And of course, if we go back to the overview, if we go back to the overview, you can now see, of course, we've got great big roads running through the middle of it. So we've got these little halls, and yeah, I suppose here there's that sort of tip around hall. Here's that church spire with all the, the buildings around it. So we are still able to see some of what was there, but also we can see just how much has changed in the meantime. I think what I wanted to talk about next, I, I absolutely adore this photo. And I think certainly as a photographer, getting this photo, this is the kind of photo you kind of dream of getting if you're doing that kind of sports photography. Uh, this isn't posed in the way, say the sheep shearers were, or you know, some, some of the others. This, this is in action. And I think we're well, we into the 1930s here or something like that. Um, so obviously, we're now at a point whereby you can cope with faster shutter speeds. So you can actually capture people in movement. I don't know what the actual shutter speed with this would have been. It's obviously fast enough so that these people are not completely blurred by movement. But at the same time, it's not razor sharp, you know, really fast shutter speed because we've got this fantastic spray smearing up as well, um, which is catching. One of the other things I found, I, I noticed about this as well, is if you like the focal point with photography, what's clearly happening is in order still to be able to let a lot of light in so they can go get as fast a shutter speed as they can, they've got a very wide aperture. And the wide aperture allows more light to come into the lens, but it creates a very narrow depth of focus. By that, we mean that it's, it's there's not a lot of places where it's sharp. As you come either side of that focal plane, it gets more and more out of focus. And we can tell where the focal plane is because of where the sharp little bits of grain are just on the ice in front of this man's shoe. As you go behind it, it gets more out of focus. And as you come in front of it, it gets more out of focus. So actually this guy is mostly standing just behind the focal point, but it's also right on a line where our guy on the right is. And if we notice, essentially, the sharpest point of this is around about his hat. So that's pretty much where the guy has got his focal point. So the guy in the front is in more focus than the guy standing only very slightly behind him. But it works perfectly. And then we've got uh, the stone sitting here beautifully out of focus. Um, you know, I, I just... Yeah, on a, on a technical point, I mean, I just know whenever I've tried, I mean, I'm not a sports photographer and, and um, I have folders full of very out of focus photos of people moving <laughs> in, in sports photography. Just the, the sheer act of actually getting that shot, because also, where is the person? He can't be as close as it feels here. He's got to be, you know, because otherwise you risk getting, you know, clobbered in the face by, by something. So he's got to be back a bit and zoomed in a fair amount, I would think. I don't know what size lens the photographer would have, but he's got to be zoomed. Also, the other thing is, is when you zoom in, you compress the amount of focal plane that you've got as well. So you are really ending up with a very narrow amount that's going to be in focus. So to try and get it in focus as these people are moving forward and as, as everything's happening, it takes quite a lot of skill. And I would imagine there'd be quite a few negatives of this where he just missed it. <laughs> so to get the bit where, not only is it in focus, but you've got these beautiful angles and lines and composition. This, this to me is just an absolute standout shot. If it's the kind where if I took that, I would be absolutely delighted. You know, what's interesting to me about this is, uh, <clears throat> as you as you say, as a photographer, you'll you'll take you'll make hundreds of of, of images, and. Uh, in many of them, you're, you're thinking, oh, if only that one bit weren't out of focus, I would have I would have a photograph. But this one, it's almost the reverse. It's almost if you if you take your thumb and cover up that stone in the foreground, the photograph doesn't work nearly as well. And it must have been certainly a, a deliberate decision, but possibly even a revelation <laughs> on the part of the, the, the photographer here. Oh, it, it's in fact that out of focus stone that's 
a significant part of what makes this photograph. Yeah. Uh, because there's such a, a, a depth, or we understand there to be such a depth to the action and that, that low point of view of the camera. And the, so the photographer is, is on the, he's on the ice here. <laughs> it's, it's very visceral. Uh, we can almost feel it. It really puts us uh, in a place where we frankly wouldn't normally be. No, absolutely. <laughs> I think also when, you, when we start talking about these narrow depths of focus where, you know, it gets out of focus before and after the vocal play. This is where photography is so separate from painting. We were talking earlier about the idea of, you know, that photography came out of a history of painting. And, it, and so, so certainly to begin with, it's very much there's a lot of photography emulating paintings. But paintings are nearly always in focus from the front to the back, no matter how deep they are, because the person painting them kept adjusting their own vision so the front of the table is in focus and the wall in the background is in focus. And actually in photography, that very rarely happens. In photography, you can't afford to have, especially on an indoor scene or something like that, um, a very narrow aperture and a very deep uh, focal plane. So for one of the key differences between photography and art, uh, painting art is the fact that you have these out of focus areas. Um, and I think, you know, this then, you know, th this would never be a painting. A, pa a painter would never have attempted or thought of painting it like this and having that out of focus stone, which, as you say, actually really, on the one hand, anchors the photo and at the same time takes us past it to focus on the sharp in focus part of the photo, which is the people. Yeah, there's some historical precedents, some interesting ones. Uh, if for, for what you're saying. Um, you know, I think one of the most famous ones is based upon Edward Muybridge's motion studies of horses done in the, mm. in the 1870s, where he sort of definitively proved via photography, um, you know, where all four of a horse's hooves are positioned when they're off the ground. You know, for, for millennia, painters had, had depicted horses with their, with their legs sort of splayed out outwards, yeah. front and back at full gallop to, to show the, a horse at full gallop to illustrate the speed and, and, the, uh, and the gravity or the inertia of, of a horse. And of course, Moybridge through photography showed, no, it's, it's actually quite, quite different. They're up under the horse when all four are off the ground. Well, you had painters subsequently in the later 19th century, in the later last three decades of the 19th century, like uh, Thomas Aikens, uh, who, who was a photographer himself. He recognized that phenomenon and also recognized that it didn't work as well in painting. Because when you showed all four of a horse so it's off the ground in a painting, it looked static. It looked like the horse was levitating. <laughs> <laughs> weightless in a, in a sense. Um, and so there's a, there's a sort of famous example uh, that he painted subsequently, I think with, um, with uh, some horses and a, and a carriage, right? Where the horses are depicted the way they should be, but the carriage's wheels are blurred like the spokes on the mm. wheels are blurred in the in the painting and it's it's subtle yeah. it's, it's certainly not one of the one of the main components of the composition but when you once you've it, once you've seen it you can you yeah. can't unsee it as as they say um and it, it's an interesting uh interesting solution but really highlights that um that difference between what we what works and what we expect in a photograph as opposed to what we expect to work in a in a painting. Yeah. This one, which I think taken again from that absolute ground level, like like the curling shot. Um, 
this one, the, the, again, you, you've got a little bit of blur movement at the, at the bottom here. It's quite a sh shallow depth of focus. Um, you know, the, the board here is just sort of slightly behind. We've got, you can see the grass where it's out of focus before. We've got a little line here, out of focus just in front. Slightly more than there was in the curling, but not a lot. The crowd in the background completely out of focus. But what an energy in this, that, 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 that really strong diagonal. I've, I talk about this on my podcast sometimes um, about compositional techniques, is that diagonals are where the energy is in an image. That when you have really strong verticals and really strong horizontals, they create anchors and strength and stability. When you put in diagonals, that's where you get movement. That's where you get energy. That's where you get anticipation. And it's a bit like if you have a pole or a tree and it's absolutely upright, it's not going anywhere. You know it's perfectly stable. You don't have to concentrate on it. If it's lying flat, likewise, it's not going anywhere. But if it's sitting diagonally, you're kind of waiting for it to fall over. Anything that's at an angle feels that little bit more precarious. So once you, in compositional terms, in painting and in photography, once you introduce diagonals, you, you get a much more, a much stronger sense of movement and energy. And with this, with the head thrown back and the, the kilt flying out there with the move, you know, as he's kind of swinging, I, the, I, I just, such a powerful photo, um, any era, you know, again, this, this could have been taken yesterday and it would still be an incredibly powerful photo. Um, but again, obviously the photographer couldn't actually be where we feel we are. We feel like we're lying on the ground three feet in front of him. <laughs> so I'm assuming the photographer must have been further back with a zoom lens. Yeah, I think there's another interesting alignment here between this uh, and another photograph in the exhibition um, called, called the Rugger by um, Alexander Wilson Hill. Um, between these photographs and another art form. And so what we're seeing here uh, and in, in Hill's Rugger is the, the, the drama of the moment sort of before release, hmm. right? Before that sort of physical release. So, and I think the diagonal you, you refer to accentuates that as well. It gives us a, a sense of expectation, of anticipation mm. of what comes next, yes. right? Um, we have to we have to use our imagination a bit, don't we? Um, and we know the facts, right? Because they're, yeah. they're, they're documented here. We can read them, um, but in terms of, of the the physicality of this, uh, we have to we have to extend ourselves as viewers uh, a bit. And, um, and of course, um, not dissimilarly, uh, you might think of Michelangelo's David, right? It's, we're, we're not seeing the moment in which that stone is, is projected. We're seeing the moment before, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it's, it's, it's so smart uh, in terms of, of the narrative of the image. Uh, that it leaves the rest to us, yeah. in a sense. Yeah, interesting. Just, just that, that very point. I remember years back when I started photography, a wedding photographer telling me that you don't shoot the kiss, you shoot the point just before the kiss. <laughs> as the lips are almost touching, as they're going towards each other, that's the most romantic place, because then when you look at the photo, everybody's projecting what comes next. The actual kiss itself also doesn't tend to look because it's just squashed faces like, you know, when you stick your face up against a piece of glass or something and you, your face smears across it, you know, it doesn't actually look as good. But that anticipation is a really powerful part of a narrative in, in imagery. Yeah. And, and then the afterwards has a bit of a, oh, my God, what have I done? <laughs> so <laughs> I don't want that either. It's true. Again, I, there's a, an anticipatory moment because what's, this isn't a point whereby, so this is women's football. The fact that the woman on the right is coming out to grab it means she must be the goalkeeper and she's got the gloves on as well. 
so it's football it's not rugby so you know whereby anybody can handle the ball she's she has to be the goalie the way the leg up is on the woman on the left um that's not a leg of somebody who's already kicked it that's the leg of somebody who's about to kick it she's about to kick it the other woman's about to grab it this is going to end in pain this is going to be really sore either one woman's going to really twist her ankle or the other one's going to end up with some football spikes halfway you know embedded in her shoulder or something this is it's it's not a it's not a good outcome in terms of uh how they and what's kind what i kind of like about this again when I, i'm giving when i do my podcasts on photography and i sort of helping people giving critique and what have you one of the things i always say is sort of you know get your horizon straight or you know make sure your verticals are vertical and you know everything about this makes me want to kind of tilt it over um anti-clockwise a little bit except except the fact that because this is dynamic in the middle of something i think you can get away with it the background is okay the fact that actually it's slightly off kilter doesn't worry you quite so much um because it, if anything it's just adding to that sense of your almost leaning forward in your seat or you're leaning forward to sort of see what happens next so again that wonderful sense of anticipation that in the middle the woman on the right with her eyes closed and almost like a tongue out you know, yeah i've got to grab this um brilliant <laughs> Yeah, you're right. And the way it's tilted, it's almost as if they're working uphill, right? <laughs> so it's an uphill battle. Um, yeah, you're right. And I wonder, and you could probably you can do this in Photoshop, of course. You know, what happens if you if you actually do straighten out that horizon? What happens? I have a feeling it's going to look like those figures okay, are leaning awkwardly that. in a way that yeah. feels unnatural. So if we get we get those. Now, what you've got to do here is it's not about creating that line and making it horizontal because that's actually going away. What we've got to do is we've got to get the verticals of this building in the background. Mm -hmm. We've got to sorry, we've got to get these verticals st straight up. Yeah. So if we turn that and just line them up so that's like that. Now we can do this one of two ways. We can either crop it, it's naturally cropping in, or actually I do have a content aware bit here which in Photoshop will naturally fill in the, these, these gaps here. So if I just hit enter and see what that does. It's going to auto fill the space. Not bad, you know, it's, it's pretty much given us the grass and a little bit of extra. So that's what it looks like. And actually, I think you're right. I think we've lost some of the energy there. Yeah, it feels like they're going to fall right out the left side of the frame. It does. It does. You're right. It, there's this there's this kind of leaning over to the left there. Whereas that by what so what the photographer and the fact is this is they could have obviously cropped this any way they like. They would have taken a slightly bigger photo and cropped in. So the vertical the that is instead of you anchoring the vertical to the buildings behind, which is generally what you would do, he's anchored he or she has anchored the the to the the, the woman on the left. Um, and then that's created the anchor, and then all that all that action is happening around that. In this case, it enhances the energy, I think, of the moment because it is a split second. You know, this is this is a, you know a point in which we can can, can make a photograph that's um, you know hundreds of, of seconds in, in duration. You know, rather than the minutes of the yes. century before. Um, so it is essentially that split that split second, which can tend to uh, cr create a very static kind of image and lose some energy. Mm. And this is this one, the ferry boat at the Carl of Loch Ausch. So long before the sky bridge was ever built, and even long before there were big heavy ferries crossing, um, crossing the water over, to, over the sea to sky, uh, we have the ferry boat with this cart, this in it, and on top of a city at this really precarious angle, <laughs> we have a woman sitting in the boat. Looks like she could be holding a baby, because there's a little boy sitting down, tucked tucked here, and you feel, well, okay, is this like the house? Is this like their possessions? Is this like sort of travellers? You know, 
you're not going to be making this journey across the water every week to go and get your shopping. Um, it, you know, could well be moving. Um, and is this a, them about, are you, are, they've got that feeling of about to set off rather than disembarking because I think she's sort of sitting, sitting there ready to go. So there's an anticipation. But the precarious angle of that card, it just scares the life out of me. <laughs> I mean, it's lashed on. They've obviously had a lot of fun trying to get it on there. Is that possibly the horse? Is that a horse's tail hanging down there? Might be. It's, it's kind of a slightly difficult to tell, but there's something coming down there. Keep that horse still. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's a sail, you know, and a sail and oars. And this guy, you know, wonderful beard and his fob watch chain and just sort of catching the light in here, and kind of like coming up with, you know, uh, that's my job done. It's in God's hands now. <laughs> Do you know anything more about this, the, the background of this image? No, not, not specifically. Um, although you, you have to think that it's the, the, the reason that it's been made, the reason that George Washington Wilson made it was, was to illustrate the, the sort of ingenuity behind this. You know, this, is, this, this kind of, of transaction is the result of, of centuries, if not millennia, of seafaring knowledge, essentially, that's been that's been passed down and was practiced is practiced every day. Uh, and um, you know whether it was a, a sort of matter of fact moment, well, it's, or, or something more extraordinary, who knows? But I, you know, I have a feeling that it wasn't uh, wasn't terribly unusual to have to to accommodate this this sort of uh, transport in the days before before mechanized before, before steam transport yeah yeah <clears throat> something i'm slightly curious about i i, I noticed it in the background the, the hill there's this shadow comes down here which looks like a kind of slight hill in the foreground except that it then overlaps the the shore in front doesn't quite make sense to me it's almost like a kind of double exposure reflection in a bit of glass or something. Um, I think what that likely is is a chemical anomaly, <clears throat> either in the in the glass plate negative or the paper. Ah, right. Yeah. Because there there isn't you know if you look across from Kyle House to Sky, there's not a even though that sort of looks like the outline of a hill, mm -hmm. there's not a, a a hill there. Um, and just sort of rises uh, from the sea toward the, the, the snowy areas up there. Uh, so I think it's a chemical anomaly. Hmm. Again, I mean, beautiful composition with this, um, you know, even to the point whereby the ore on here is sort of pointing over to what looks like a built up area on the other side, you know, like this is the direction we're going in as the, uh, you know, um, yeah. It's, it's a very well thought out photo, this. At the point that we're recording this video, uh, we just, it's two days after Burns night. Um, and here we have the piping in of the haggis. Uh, obviously on board a ship, this one, we've got the sailors in the background, we've got the decking underneath. Everybody seems to have their right foot forward at the same time. So presumably they're all marching in step. Um, having said that, they all, they all seem to be leaning, except for this guy at the back, who I think seems to be leaning the opposite way. I suspect he's got his, his other foot forward. <laughs> um, but he's at the back, so nobody else is noticing. But in a way, apart from the fact that it's black and white, with even that kind of slight sepia tint to it, this could almost just as easily have been taken two nights ago as opposed to however many decades back. Yeah. Well, this, this was uh, the ship, the Andalusia Star. And um, here we're seeing it uh, transporting probably passengers, refrigerated cargo, uh, mail uh, to South America. Uh, and um, the, this is, again, this is a 
press photograph. Uh, so the label on the back of it describes the, this, the haggis being delivered to Scots in, in South America. Uh, so, <laughs> um, long journey, I, I would say. But, but what's interesting again is sort of um, what happens outside the frame of the picture. You know, what, what's, what's the rest of the story? And um, th these were, of course, this is a celebratory image, but these were uh, this was leading up to, to turbulent times and not so long after this photograph was taken, or made, I believe in 1942, the Andalusia star was sunk by a German U-boat. Oh, wow. uh, on its journey from uh, Buenos Aires to Liverpool, hmm. um, most of most of the passengers and, and crew were rescued, but the but the ship was scuttled. Wow! Is this a John Logie Baird early television? Well, one of the things that the that the McKinnon collection clearly articulates, and and I think one of the things that that Murray McKinnon when he amassed this collection was was very interested in was the way that photography grew hand in hand with the industrial revolution it's really part and parcel of the industrial revolution uh, both the spirit of it and the promise of it as, as we saw in the in the fourth bridge and uh, in the uh, you know the, the shipbuilding on the Clyde images um, but also as we, as we get into the 20th century, the way that uh, it went hand in, in hand with other inventions that these days we can't imagine living without, like television. Uh, and John Logie Baird here was essentially the inventor uh, of television. He's experimenting with, with something here uh, in the years after his, his introduction of, of television. This was called Noctovision and, and I, I think used x-rays to, to transmit uh, an image. Uh, All right. Wow. The idea was transmitting an image of, of somebody from complete darkness. Uh, it's, a, it's obviously something that didn't uh, grab us in the way that television did. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, it's good to know he kept at it. I was trying to work it out. I mean, when I saw the caption that it was it was John Logie Baird, I thought, okay, is this, is this an early form of television, a microphone, and what have you? It didn't quite make sense. Also, the the the, the posing is so strained. <laughs> you know, as as the the photographer is saying, right? No, no, move your hand a little higher. Uh, just gonna, no, look, lean forward a little bit. You're blocking that that apparatus behind you. Um, no, now you've kind of gone too far forward. And, you know, there's a bit of me thinks what he was probably really wanting was a little bit more gap around the head rather than, mm -hmm. you know, just to kind of create a little bit more space, but it didn't quite work. Because if, if the guy standing wasn't quite there, then he would have blocked out the apparatus behind. So this is very much a kind of compromise trying to get the photo he wants, and it's not quite where he wants it, but it's it's Put your hand on that bit. Why would I touch <laughs> that bit? <at> this <laughs> um, yeah, but it's again, it's got that very kind of almost retro futuristic feel to it with all these kind of tubes coming down, almost like uh, Robbie the Robot from um, uh, Lost in Space, the 1950s, you know, it, you, you, or it always reminds me of, uh, was it the 1920s Metropolis movie, uh, the old black and white, uh, you know, again, futurism, um, but futurism from a century ago uh, is, is, or, you know, the kind of, is, is he sitting there ready to, you know, like kind of H.G. Wells time machine, just about to sort of launch into some kind of weird, uh, weird new futuristic invention and steampunk almost. I think not unlike the, the John D. Stephen Dawn of Light and Liberty image, uh, we're seeing a manifestation in photography in the, in the early 20th century here that, that brings it uh, much more in alignment with what we expect from other visual forms in terms of this image being more suggestive than, than depictive in, it, in its intent. 
um, it doesn't give us a, a lot of information, as it were. Uh, it's meant to, I think, in 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 ways perhaps greater than than many, if not most, of the other photographs in the McKinnon collection. Um, suggest photography's capacity to address memory and nostalgia and to, to be able to, to personalize experience uh, that we see in these images. And um, in that way, it has the capacity to, to be much more emotive uh, and address, and address uh, less tangible aspects of the world. And so, so here, you know, we, we have a, a, a young person out in the forest, presumably alone, uh, gazing, into, gazing into a mirror. Again, somebody uh, who is at, at an age in which change is at the forefront, um, you know, on the, on the, the sort of the promise of adulthood, but still with those, those uh, adventurous aspects uh, brought along from, from childhood and, and, you know, all of the uh, knowns and unknowns that seem to be converging uh, in, in unexpected ways at that age, um, the sort of self, literally, self-reflectiveness uh, and, um, and solitude uh, in, in this forest, forest uh, environment. So it's almost as if we're, we're catching a, a glimpse into a private moment. Yeah, well, but while at the same time being so staged for that, you know, um, I think it, what is one of those interesting things that we, we see this in movies all the time where you, you look at the reflection in the mirror and you see the person's face and it looks as though they are looking at themselves in the mirror but they're not because at their angle, in order for us to see their face, they have to be looking at the reflection of the camera. So when she's looking into that mirror, she's seeing the camera lens. She's not seeing herself. Um, you know, I, you, you, whenever I've played with mirrors before, I keep, and I want somebody to, I have to say, look at the camera in the mirror, don't look at yourself in the mirror. And then that way you sort of get that, that it looks like they're looking at themselves. I find it odd with this one though, that the mirror is so dark here that obviously the way this has been edited, she's been lightened up, her head, her arm, neck, and what have you, so that your attention gets drawn here and it gets darker. I would have expected the reflection to be slightly lighter. Um, I mean, again, if we just open that in Photoshop, first of all, if we take the levels and just, bring up the highlights and bring down the shadows a little bit. So you get that's probably a little bit more how it would have looked before it was starting to fade. Um, but I think also what I will do is if I will just take the curves here and brighten that up and then mask off that whole area. And then just with the curves, paint back in that. So what all I'm doing here is just lightening up that particular area in a way Maybe that's slightly too bright, but just pull that down a little bit. Something like that, I think, would have made slightly more sense with the with the printing. You we we're drawn to her, but we also but that reflection is a really important part of the picture. And I think in the pro in the printing process, as we see it here, it's kind of got a little bit lost. So I don't know whether that was accidental or whether that was purposeful um, with that, but I. I found it quite surprising when obviously the face and the neck has been brightened up you would also want to have that bit of mirror there grabbing a little bit more attention as well also why is why is the mirror stuck onto a tree like that <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah yeah no absolutely um again i suppose in a way this is more like um more like an illustration than a painting. You wouldn't see a painting so much like this, but I can imagine it almost like that kind of Alice in Wonderland style, you know, or the, the turn of the century Edwardian style 
illustrations where you're creating you know an image or like peter pan kind of thing you know it's not full-on paintings and this photography sort of seems to be trying to cross over some kind of boundary or maybe i mean is this around the era of the cottlestone fairies you know there's 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 almost that kind of feel to that slightly otherworldly as you say kind of cusp of puberty and, and what have you where world is changing as well and um it's certainly evoking some kind of you know nostalgic I ideal i suppose rather than than, than a documented reality yeah well and of course we know from the well, just think of the George Washington Wilson image of the of the fourth bridge, um, how absolutely sharp and and you know printed with such clarity uh, that image is from you know nearly fifty years prior to this one. So we we have to ask the questions. Well, right? How did we regress here somehow? <laughs> no. No, the intention was, was to, to create essentially a more romantic image. And one of the ways to, to suggest that in a photograph was to use various tools at hand um, to make it softer. This is one that I, I, I couldn't pass up. I, I look at this with the eye of someone as a photographer who creates narrative photos who arranges people and does a tableau really um and all i can see is the awkwardness of the photographer not getting it right of of having this idea in mind and everybody feeling like they're being told they've got to play along and nobody feeling particularly comfortable about the roles they've been played it's like everybody knows this is never going to work except for the photographer. Um, and obviously the photographer still felt it did work because he was quite happy to put it out in the world and create a print from it. Um, initially, you, I think you look at this and you're not sure, maybe it's a hunting party you're seeing, you know, they, the, the people are holding their easels like rifles, you know, they're kind of, you know, sort of sitting around. But you, you have, when you start looking, you, what on earth is this guy doing lying down with his hand, you know, this, this guy next to him with one leg up and his, his hand on his knee? You, who sits like that? Who lies like, you know, is this really the group of artists ready to go out? You just happen to capture them um, with the wife here with a bowl of soup ready to you know feed them up or they've just had their lunch or they've just come back or whatever this guy just with the look on his face going for god's sake get this thing over with or how long can i grip my teeth until you you know <laughs> he's just i've had enough i'm just going to stare over here and i'm just you know let me know when this is over um he's i've got no idea what's going on just just get on with it you know None of them look particularly comfortable. They all look like they've been forced into some god awful pose. Um, and there they go. If imagine that's the only, you know, when you talked earlier, you said about the idea of how many photos of us are out there. And in this day and age of um, security television and being in the background of somebody else's wedding photos, there could be literally thousands of photos of us out there that we never know. Yet perhaps for some of these guys, this is the only known photo ever of them. And imagine being one of those, and that's the only photo there ever was of you, you know, lying on the floor like this, trying to, I, I have no idea. I just, I just feel for the, for the poor souls <laughs> stuck in that photo, having to have that photo taken of them. Well, and if, if they knew uh, that we, looking at the photographs today, would have no idea who these people are as individuals, <laughs> Because they're not named, they're not identified. But I think it's strange. It is. It is that point of very often we look at old photos and we feel that they are giving us some sort of depth and seriousness, and that there is a there is a weightiness that we need to, you know, we kind of almost place them on a pedestal. I think that this is history, and we and it's supposed to be important and it's weighty and it's, um, and. I don't get any of that with this photo. I don't feel the weightiness of it. I just feel 
a photographer who was trying something who got it really badly wrong, but wasn't self-aware enough to even realise he got it badly wrong because it's printed and it's out there. I can only think it's that somebody as, as like where they sort of they study tableau. They see maybe they've seen some of those fantastic photos we say we see sometimes of, you know, people in the Midwest you know, with their hunting rifles and out there and there, you know, and you go, my God, that is a piece of history. And these are real people. And they were out there in the real wilds and they were taking their lives in their hands or, you know, or even, you know, like when you see that carriage on the, the ferry about to go across to, to sky, you, you just have that sense of jeopardy and that sense of reality. And he's trying to recreate this, but failing badly. Well, you know, and I wonder, as I said, what, what the intention was, but clearly there, there was some notion of capturing this group of artists at Coburn's Path at this particular time. Um, and that makes it, uh, I think, all the more, all the more uh, sort of bothersome that, that we don't know exactly who these, who these artists were. So if anyone out there uh, recognizes uh, any of these folks from one of your family's albums or, uh, you know, uh, any other kind of photograph, uh, do let us know. Mm, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Check your family likenesses. If this person spit an image of your brother, this may well be your grandfather. Lying on the floor. <laughs> I noticed this one, a, a colour photo. Um, but it wasn't done, uh, my understanding is this wasn't done by a typical kind of standard hand painting colouring in. It's a different kind of process, photochrome or something. Can you give me any kind of background on this? Yeah, photochrome. So this essentially would have started with uh, a, a glass plate negative. Um, and you know, later in the 19th century, about the last decade of the 19th century, we would have been able to uh, essentially translate that image via, via colour uh, through a, a sort of uh, lithographic-esque process. Um, so it, it's, it's sort of unnaturally applied or artificially applied color to this scene, but did start with a, with a black and white image. I mean, it's essentially a mechanically uh, printed image, but did start uh, with a, a photographic negative. So you can, you can imagine that um, you know, for so many decades uh, with photography coming as close as it did to the way our eyes sees the world and the way our brain understands the world, there was just that one critical bit missing color. Uh, there was a real hunger, I think, to see images in color. That's why even all the way back to, to daguerreotypes from the 1840s, 1850s. Uh, they're often hand colored, mm. whether it's just a little blush on the, on the cheeks to give some, some life to the image or whether it's something much more uh, elaborate in terms of fully colored garments and backgrounds and, and everything. Uh, there was a desire to, to create a, a color image, uh, but it wasn't until the early 20th century that, that we really had the uh, viable means to do that uh, in a way that was, again, uh, reproducible. Uh, you know, we, we could make, there's a color process called autochrome, which is a color transparency that we could do uh, in, in the, around the turn of the century, but uh, it wasn't until some decades later, we were able to make the kind of color images that we, we know now. Um, so this was a, a sort of early form of being able to uh, get a color image out to the public. And one I, one I really love, actually, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's, a, it's a commercial photograph made for commercial purposes, but the, the paper cutting image from Stonywood in Aberdeen. I think it's just a, it's a fantastic image. And, and, and that one combined with the, the cooperage of, of whiskey barrels. Yes. Um, <clears throat> this one. Yeah, yeah. 
or this, yes, I must admit this, this I think is quite possibly one of, I think along with the, um, along with the curling photo, I think, you know, this is probably also as a, as a photographer, a kind of photographer's favorite with this photo. Um, it's the light in it is just astonishingly beautiful. And what works really well with this part of it is, is the backlight is the fact that you've got this light coming through the doorway behind is what gives it the depth. If you didn't, if it was just a closed door and everything just disappeared into the shadow, it wouldn't have anything like the same amount of effect. It's like one of those little tricks. If you're ever photographing a forest, you've always got this problem that it gets darker as it goes on. So if you're standing looking at this row of trees, you only get the front of the trees. But if there's light behind, if there's an opening, a gap further back in the forest, and there's light behind the trees, suddenly your forest picture springs to life in a way that it just doesn't. And this is the same kind of thing because there's a light coming through behind, it gives real depth to this picture. Um, so it, the, the use of light, I think is fantastic. But then the, the, the diagonals again, that, that sense of movement. And again, one of those things, I mean, while I suppose this is probably a mix of posed and documentary you know the, the the guy will have set up with his camera and said okay carry on now or stop for a moment these guys are cleaning the inside of the barrels or whatever it is they're doing there's another bit which is when you're trying to capture movement and you're not wanting people to be blurred you have to try and get the still moment in any so if these people are circling round, going round the barrel as they're scrubbing you need to go click at the point where they're at the peak, either when their arm is at most extended or when their arm is most pulled back, just before it starts moving up again. If you get it when that's sort of halfway round, the arm is gonna blur. It sort of slows down there, speeds up, slows down, speeds up, slows down, slow. And so you kind of need to get your timing right to maximize the fact that actually they still feel quite still while at the same time being in a pose where you really get a sense of movement and power and energy going into those barrels. And both, both of these images in their own ways remind me, and in di slightly different ways, remind me of that sort of famous Lewis Hine image of the, of the, the worker with the, this big bit of machinery and it's sort of a, a man versus machine kind of sensibility to it. But this is another one in which, uh, yeah, it's that it's has to be that moment. And it's just the tips of his fingers rested right there, and um, you know, yes. and uh, the and the light, yeah, yeah, the light sort of pouring through onto the the whiteness of the paper. Again, you've got that that little light patch back here, which mm -hmm. helps to give definition to and likewise these rolls of paper in the background here just so that it's not total shadow behind these bits here help give definition to the foreground as well here's a thought this you're curating is it something in the region of 14 to 15000 photos from what 1850s 1950s this kind of century of of stuff. What kind of photos do you think are likely to be curated a hundred years from now? What will we be, we be fascinated with? That's a very good question. I think with photography, we're probably always going to look for that residue or, or remnant of the time in which it was made. Um, both through what's represented in the photograph and what kind of photograph it is and how it was made. Uh, and sometimes the synthesis of the two, like I say, the, with the McKinnon collection and that span of a of hundred years, uh, we're looking at that first century of photography itself that, that grew with the industrial revolution that grew with advances in technology and in advances in engineering and advances of our, of our understanding of, of chemistry. Um, optics, for sure. So when we look back, you know, what, what, 
we'll certainly look for those subjects that are representative of now. And that, that's certainly apparent in, in any uh, photograph created for, for the news media and that sort of thing. Um, I think we're going to, uh, and I hope we do. I, ho I hope we do have to sift through the, the hundreds of millions of, <laughs> of images. I mean, I, I hope they're still around for us to have to sift through uh, and, and be able to identify some of those nuances in our, in our social lives, uh, in, our, in our, probably in, even in our private lives. <laughs> I mean, who knows what people will be seeing then, what, what will stick around. Um, but I also expect that we'll, we'll lament what's been lost. You know, because you know, for every every thousand images that somebody dumps on the internet, how many just vanish into the into the ether? <laughs> you know, who knows? Um, and of course, we still have the phenomenon in which historic photographs uh, are being lost, mm. um, and that's why that's why being able to preserve something like the McKinnon Collection for the nation uh, through through the the National Galleries and the National Library is so significant. Who, each of who, by the way, has deep photographic collections uh, in addition to, to the McKinnon collection. Uh, so all together, they are us, right? Um, th th this, is, this is who we are. And for our entire lives anyway, photography has been, uh, has been with us. It's been a part of not just what we do, but arguably how we think and yeah. in a sense, our outlook on the world, how we see ourselves and not just in, in, in a physical way. Um, and it's, it's still forever changing. I think we're still forever trying to get our heads around what it means to us, aren't we? And, uh, and that's, a healthy, that's a healthy state, I think. That's a healthy state. That what that suggests to me is it, it's it's still living and breathing in a way. Uh, it's not a relic of the past. Now, what about then the idea of printing? I mean, so much of our photography now is sort of disposable, put onto a digital format. And yet, I mean, we used, I remember, first of all, when they used to say, well, look, you know, you, these, you've put it on digital, this will now survive forever. And yet, so it was put on floppy disks, but you, you can't even use it. So they put on CDs and DVDs, but how many computers even have a CD player anymore? And so now it's stored somewhere on the cloud, but something gets hacked or there's something and it goes and these digital images disappear forever. Um, what about printing? Should we be printing more of our photos, or may perhaps curating our photos, and at least they're even at least printing the best ones? I think that's an important question uh, because what what that really uh, there, there's that question from a moment to moment, day to day perspective, but there's that question also in terms of digital digital preservation. Um, you know, how do we how do we ensure that? these images are preserved uh, digitally as well. And of course, printing is, is um, I think, an important aspect of photography that we do lose a bit when we experience everything on a screen um, because we, we, we do associate things that we witness on a screen to be transitory, mm -hmm. right? Um, we move on to the to the next thing, uh, but but a print, you you can hold it in your hand, even if it's stored in a box under your bed. You can pull that box out, you know, at, at your leisure and, and open it up and, and look at the photo, which is exactly what Murray McKinnon did with, mm -hmm. with his collection. They weren't under the bed; um, <laughs> they were actually quite professionally stored uh, and archivally stored, for that matter. He was very wise about that. Um, you know, but, but when he, when he you know, had a moment in which he just wanted to sit down and, and look at all of his, uh, the photographs in his collection of transport, 
that's the way he had them organized. And I think it, it, in a sense that's, that's brilliant uh, in terms of, of how we might organize our, our own images. Uh, I, I do think there's, there's great significance to that sort of physical object uh, that you can hold and, and you, can, you can see uh, in different kinds of light uh, at different times of day that you can look at over a duration in which you know, you're approaching it from different times in your life, different moods, uh, means different things to you at different points. Uh, and there's no better way to, to really give yourself the time to experience that than to hold a print in your hands. I think you're right. I think there is something so different. I, I mean, I know this with my, as a professional photographer where most, well, you know, a lot of what I photograph, or most of what I photograph really is for somebody else. And most of it gets, you know, when I do a photo shoot for a client, I then send them the digital files. I very rarely actually see my work printed up. But sometimes I do. Um, perhaps I've done a piece for a magazine and then I get a copy of the magazine and I look at the photos and there they are in print on a piece of paper. And it's almost like looking at somebody else's photo. I know these photos so well. I've gone in and I have manipulated every single pixel to polish it up, to make sure that the right bit is in the right place, that it's all edited to the level it needs to be edited to appear in a magazine. But, it's always, but it has a life of its own once it's printed in a way that is different to the, dig to the digital. I can, it feels like I will spend more time looking at it, whereas on a screen, we, we're in that kind of Instagram mode, scroll past. We, we, our attention span for a digital image is a handful of seconds, maybe not you know, half a second, a fraction of a second, maybe one second, maybe two, maybe long enough for us to just click like, or even write a little, great to see you up and about again, or no, I hated my coffee at that place too, or whatever it else. And that's about as much attention as we give it. But a printed piece, we spend a little bit, we spend longer looking at it. And I suppose there's an extension of that, which is what happens when you put it in a frame and stick it on the wall? Then we have a sense of it being art. We actually, we, we're now told that by framing it, it is important. And so we can't help but spend more time looking at it, feeling that it is worth the attention of several seconds, maybe even a few minutes, maybe longer, maybe worth revisiting and coming back and looking at again. Whereas on a Facebook feed or an Instagram feed, mentally it's just placed on an instant and disposable. I've seen it, I've scrolled past it, it's forgotten. And another way to do that is, um, you know, what I'm cataloging right now in the McKinnon collection are the 19th, early 20th century photographic albums. And I think that's a wonderful way to, to experience photographs and, and would encourage you know, folks to, to, you know, step back in time <laughs> you know, if you, if you, you know, once you're able to get out in the world again and, and travel, uh, and you make you know, hundreds of photographs or thousands of photographs from your from your journey. Um, you know, print them out, put them in an album, um, and uh, even if that album lives on your bookshelves for for most of its time, there are going to be those moments in which you walk by and you think, "I'm going to pull this out and just take a few minutes with it. Uh, I think that I would suggest there are very few times that one regrets that activity uh, because you, you, they're wonderful, not just memories, but sort of new discoveries that you find every time. Yeah, I think that's true. There's also that notion of the passing on to the next generations. Um, I, I, once we were past the work, once we'd all kind of had our first round of vaccines or second round of vaccines, I finally got down to see my father who I'd not seen for nearly two years. And when I saw him, he um, also, while I was there, picked up one of the old family albums that we have of photos from, that go from when my parents were sort of just after they were married through to when I was about 10 years old or thereabouts. So it covers a particular, and it's one of these things where we, I know those photos so well from as a child looking at them and again and again, but I haven't seen them for decades. And that note, but being able to then show my daughter 
these photos of what daddy was like when he was a kid, of what grandparents were like when they were young. And even who my grandparents, who, in fact, actually, I, you know, who died when I was only two or three. So I don't really have any memory of them. I only have memories of them through the photos. And interestingly, I always love, there's, there's a particular photo of my grandfather and my, my father's mother and father. And you've got this little old couple and they are old. They are really old. They are kind of sort of sitting there in clothes that are too big for them because they sort of shrunk into them. And they've got no, you know, false teeth of come out. So, you know, the, the jaw is kind of pushing up and wrinkles to sort of, you know, and you look at them and you think they must be, you know, 140 years old at least, you know. And then the date, you look at the date and it's the date is something like 1963, 1964. And then you say, you know, oh, hang on a sec. But they were born in like 1901, 1902. The, the, this really old couple are like 62 years old in these photos. <laughs> I go, whoa, you know, they compared to modern 62 year olds, you know, these look like they're 30 years older. Um, and it's, I mean, that, that sense of, is it just because of the way they're dressing? Is it that life was so much harder in those days? Is it that you kind of expected to get old and so started behaving older and dressing older and looking older? I remember my mother talking about some aunt of hers who when she was 40 years old, decided she wouldn't go upstairs on a bus anymore. Um, you know, that there's an expect at where, which, you know, we don't have that, you know, from, baby boomers through X genera generation X and, and what have you, there hasn't been that expectation to grow old in the same way. We still kind of feel more or less like teenagers playing at grown ups a lot. Um, I know I'm shooting off on wild tangents here. I think, I, I suppose really it's that notion of going back to the photo albums, being able to revisit and that they have that sense of you tap into them in a different way than looking at a digital photo. There is something about when, as you say, when you physically hold something there, it takes on a different level of importance. And if you do go to the effort of making a photo album, write down who those people are. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Because yes, I do have another photo album somewhere which my dad has said, well, I think that was your uncle. So, you know, and, but, you know, it's a bunch of people for whom I don't really know who any of them are and anybody who would know who they are has gotten now as well. That's one of the, the beauties of, of the internet is that uh, you know, these days, a lot of these records are online, you know, from, from the census to other kinds of, of, of family uh, and civic Civic, civic records. So uh, if you do have someone's name, you, you're able to, to trace, uh, you know, various family lines and, and uh, you know, start to uh, discover things about, you know, the communities in, in which people lived and the, and the sort of social circumstances that they were, uh, that were imposed upon them and, and that they created for themselves as, as well. Mm -hmm. thoroughly enjoyed this this time chatting with you blake uh, thank you so much for your thoughts insights background and for curating this collection for us uh, it's a wonderful set of photos and currently at the uh Kukubri galleries there's a collection of, sort of 30 35 or something i think of, of these images yep. um yep. but as you say there's fourteen thousand more yes. sitting out there yep. Um, really looking forward to seeing seeing them as they come online and then at some point in the future being able to actually come and see these in the flesh 